off, I want to welcome you. If you're a first-time guest, could we welcome all of our first, second? At this point, so we, we have this, we had this saying back in the day that if you came once, you're a guest. If you come twice, you're family. So if this is your second time here, welcome to the family. Amen. So we're so appreciative that you guys are here. Uh, if this is your first time, or if you've been here before and you didn't fill out a, a Connect card, we do have two different ways that you can fill that out. We do have a digital Connect card. What you'll do is you'll pull out your phone, you'll text WELCOME to 918-265-0550. If technology works like it's supposed to, you will receive a link back that is a digital Connect card. If you don't want to take the chances, if you look on one of the seats in front of you, on the back of one of the seats in front of you, you'll see a blue card that Lacey's holding up that says, thank you for joining us. If you would take that, fill that out, and I have a new volunteer that's going to help me get organized and do some stuff. So, Miss Jen, if you wave your hand, she's wearing fittingly, fittingly the brightest shirt in the room, so you cannot miss her. So if you fill that out and get that to her, she is now helping me in this area. I gave her a crash course in stuff uh, yesterday, so we'll see how it goes. But it would be better than me doing it because y'all don't want to know. Um, I'm not good at keeping up with emails and all that stuff. So, uh, But if you would, go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to continue a little bit in our, we're going to continue in our series on the end times. And the way, the way I felt God having me approach this is always in the form of a question. So the first question that we, we answered, if I remember correctly, is um, the end, question mark, the end. Like, is it really? And then the second question was, why does it have to end? Why will all things end? And it's super important for us to understand why. And I had I talked to Jonathan, and he's like, I don't think I've really heard anybody approach it that way. Because most of us, when we talk about end times, when we hear end times things preached about, we talk about it, but we don't talk about the reason why those things will come to an end. So that first week, we answered the question of um, that if you look in Genesis 3, it tells you that when, when Adam fell, not only was mankind cursed, but earth was cursed as well. So in God working all things out, the way that he's going to work all things out, he's releasing not only us, but he's also releasing the earth from its curse. So plain and simple, so that's why. That as we are redeemed, the earth is redeemed also. Amen? So we talked a lot about food that week. I had the, the molded hamburger. Uh, we had one lady, I said, how many of you would leave your spouse for a hamburger? I said, nobody would, and she looked and was like, eh. It depends on how good that hamburger is. So, <laughs> like, man, I don't, anyways, um, we'll move on from that. And then week two, we answered the question of when it will end. And we know that there's a lot of people in the world, there's a lot of people throughout history that have tried to answer that question with the definite, this is when Jesus is coming back. But what we understand according to what scripture says is Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming back. So if Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back, how can you know when he's coming back? He didn't give a date. He didn't say, I'm coming back October 15th, 2062. This is when I'm coming back. He didn't say that. He said, I don't know. Only the Father knows. But he gave us signs and things for us to be on the lookout for that when we see these things happening, he didn't say the end is coming. He said, but the end is near. He didn't say it's now the end. He's like, but it's getting there. When you see these things happen, so as, we go, as you go through Scripture and you start looking at end times prophecy and you, and you listen to other speakers and other preachers, because I know y'all do, uh, when you listen to other speakers and preachers, whenever they try to give a definite answer, just, okay, you're one of those. It's not saying that everything else they said is bad. It's just saying, I'm not trying to put a date on it. I just want to be ready when he comes. So these are the signs. Okay, that's a sign. You guys remember we did rapture practice? I didn't do that today. Um, today, I want to answer another question. It's tribulation. Tribulation with a question mark. What is it? 
What does it look like? Hopefully, I will answer the question if we have enough time to get to it and, and I prepared enough. Hopefully, I'll be able to answer the question of where will we be as believers? What will the tribulation period look like for us? So I'm going to start in Mark chapter 13. This, I read part of this. I don't know if it was this exact book, but we did read this question. This is where uh, week two, this is where we started because Jesus was talking to his disciples. And the disciples, if you remember, they, they came out of the temple and they looked and said, hey, Jesus, look at the temple. It's amazing. Look at all the windows and the doors. And man, is this cool. And Jesus turns back and he looks at them because he was just waiting to tell them to break the news. And he says, every one of those stones will be taken away. Everything is going to be torn down, not a stone left upon one another. And so his disciples asked him this question, when will these things be? So in Jesus answering this question, he continues. He doesn't just answer one particular question, but he continues into this thought, and this is where we're at in Mark chapter 13. We're going to look, start in verse 14, or 15, 14, and it says this. This is Jesus speaking. All before this is Jesus speaking, and he says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by, the Dan by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not to, and he says, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field go back to get it, let not go back to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who, who are nursing in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be a tribulation. Say tribulation. For in those days there will be a tribulation such as, ha such as has not been seen, has not been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, never, ever, or nor ever shall be. I'm adding words. Nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. For the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Let's pray. Father, I thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to speak. Lord, as I prayed before, before I ever came into the sanctuary, for his service, Lord, I pray that you fill my mouth, that you fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you fill me with more knowledge than what I have at my disposal, that you allow me to speak beyond my years, beyond my study, beyond my training, that our hearts and our minds are open to hear what your word has to say for us, and that it changes us, that it sparks this hunger and this need to share your gospel in us. Father, I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Jesus, in, in verse 19, is my main verse. He says, for in those days there will be a tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. So Jesus, in his conversation with his disciples, telling him about when these things will happen, he tells them about this tribulation, what's called a tribulation time frame. And he says, nothing like it has ever, has ever been up to this time, nor ever will be. Now, if you can go back in time and you can stand with Jesus when he's telling them this, you would see that they are Israelites, but they are under rule of another government. That everything that they are allowed to do is based upon the government allowing them to do it. Not only that, they are now Christians, so they so not only do they have a Roman rule, but they also have a Jewish rule also that, create, that controls everything religious. And then here comes Jesus saying that I'm going to show you a different way and I'm leading you down a different path. So with those, two, with those two things ahead of them, can you imagine the tribulation and the turmoil and the fights they had to have in order to grow in their faith in Jesus? We know, because we all sit here, that Jesus ultimately died for what he was preaching. He gave his life to show all people that this religious system and this religious system and this religious system has nothing to do with who God really is, but I'm coming and I'm giving my life for you to show you and tell you that I am really the only way and the true way to my Father. Some people don't like that in our day. Some of you, it may just rub you the wrong way. I really don't care. It is not up to me, and I know that sounds harsh, but it's not up to me. I'm not Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, 
No one gets to the Father except by me. Who am I to say, well, okay, well, I know that you came from heaven and you're God's son, but I really do think that there's more paths than one. Does that make sense? So what is this word tribulation? What does this word mean? This word, even without, be, how many of you have watched uh, or read books about end times things? Like the Left Behind series that was really, really popular and, until one particular actor who remains unnamed at this moment decided to do a version of it and it went downhill from there. Um, I'm not going to say his name, but his last name is something that you put animals in. Um, Um, Anyways, this word, so this word, even without giving you a definition, it carries enough with it to let us know one thing, it's not going to be good, right? Even if I don't give you a definition, if I say, man, you're going to have tribulation, what does that mean? Oh, man, it ain't going to be good. Not good. (laughs) Joe McGee, not good. Not good. Um, (laughs) tribulation implies discomfort struggle pain uneasiness but by definition it actually means it means that but it means something else it means that that things will be so bad both internally and externally that you will look for a way out but you won't find one The word, by definition, actually means pressure. And it's an internal, not just external, but internal and external pressure that's so great that it leaves you trapped in distress, affliction, and persecution. The word tribulation is not not good. There are so many people in our world now, we've talked about this a lot over the last few months, where there are a lot of people that are dealing with anxiety. One of the things with anxiety is that I feel like I've got no way out, that as my mind goes down this path and I feel trapped and then I'm freaking out because I don't know how this is going to work out and I don't know which way to go and we know that it means that we're we're torn apart. And so it's like, ah, and I, I feel stuck, I feel trapped. But can you imagine that the word tribulation is that plus some. It's not only that on the inside where you feel trapped, but it's everything on the outside that actually shows you that you are. And so when Jesus says that there's going to be a time of tribulation that's never been seen, not before, not now, not until it actually happens, there's going to be a period of tribulation that's so great that you're going to look to get out of it, but you're not going to have any hope. Man. So when we, when we speak of this tribulation period, I just, I just said that. Never mind. So think of church history. I, I like church history. I like learning things. But one of the things that's really, really prominent in church history is the persecution they, that, they, that their early church faced. That we understand, most of you, you've heard this, some of you may not have, that there was one particular uh, well-known emperor by the name of Nero, that he took particular enjoyment in trying to destroy Christianity. He was not a sane man in any way. Uh, history tells us that. That the way the persecution actually started is that he set, they believe that he set one of the Roman buildings or the Colosseum on on fire and then blamed it on the Christians, and that's what started the persecution. But his persecution was so great on Christians, and you've you've heard me say this before, that he would he was known to dip them in tar, impale them on a stake, and then light them on fire in order to light the walkway, like to his palace. So this is this is not a good man. We read in Hebrews that there were people that were sawn in two, that they were beheaded, that they were killed, that they were hanged, 
We know of people like uh, Polycarp, that was one of the early church fathers, that he was actually burned at the stake. His story is particularly amazing. We know that John the Baptist says that he was actually tied and, and was lowered into boiling oil, but he came out unscathed. So we know that in church history, it tells us that persecution was bad, but Jesus says, no, you ain't seen nothing yet. So to get us to, get us to kind of understand, I want us to look at a few scriptures, and I'm going to try to go through as fast as I can. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 6. Brandy, would you go ahead and put that first graph up there real quick? <clears throat> so in, in processing this and going through this, of course, one thing I do is I listen to a lot of people that know more about this than I do. Uh, one particular person, uh, Dr. David Jeremiah, um, has had this type of graph, not this exact one, but this type of graph in one of the sermons that he was talking about, or one of the sermons where he was preaching about this. And what he, he had this question that this mom's child asked her. And he said that the, the child was like, there's, Dr. David, he keeps saying that there's no time before, there's really nothing that needs to happen before Jesus, but then he talks about the second coming and the tribulation. So which is it? Does nothing need to happen or is there something that needs to happen? And so what he does is he puts this graph up and he says, according to scripture, there's a few things that we know that have to happen. One of them was the first coming of Christ. How many believe that that's happened? How many of you know that that's happened? I know that that's happened. There's a first coming of Christ. Well, then according to scripture, the age that we're in now is called the church age. The reason why everything's not, as, as some people say, uh, gone to hell in a handbasket, the reason why that hasn't happened is because we're here. The reason why, as bad as this world is, the reason why it doesn't get any worse is because you're here. It, the world can only get so dark as long as there's light shining, right? So we're in, we're in the church age. But what Jesus is talking about is this, after this, this line right here, where he says that there's this tribulation period that's coming. There, there's the time of pressure. There's that time of no escape, no release that the distress and the turmoil that you're going to face on a day-to-day -day basis is going to be so great, and you're going to want to get out, but you're not going to find one. This is the period that, that we're talking about today, and it talks about this in Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 6, um, I listen, also listened to um, John Lindell, I think it's Lindell, from um, James River Church. You guys have been there. Uh, James River Church, he uh, listened to a sermon that he did, and, and he actually made this graph. I didn't have time to make it uh, because I didn't see it till last night. But he had this graph where he says, in American thinking, we think of everything linear. Just like that line, we think of everything linear. So when we think of all the things that we're getting ready to read, we're thinking that this thing happens, then this thing happens, then this thing happens, then this thing happens. He said, but the more realistic thought behind what John is showing us and what we're going to read here in a minute is that it's really things compounding on another. That it's more of a circular thought or levels. That this thing happens and this thing happens and this thing happens and this thing happens. So it's not that this thing happens and this one happens. It's this one happens and they're happening at the same time. So Revelation chapter 6, it begins with the seals. They're seals. There's trumpets and there's bowls. Thank you. Seals, trumpets, and bowls. There's seven of each. The first one that it talks about is the first seal. So we're going to read through this. Like I said, I'm trying to go through this as, as fast as possible. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So there's actually, if I, if I remember right, the Islamic people, they're waiting for a, for a person coming on a white horse. Is that correct? I, I can't remember. Um, is, is that right? They're waiting for a conqueror to come on a white horse. That's their savior. That this white horse, he's coming to conquer and conquering. So he's coming and he's taking over things. He's displacing people. He's destroying things all for the sake of taking over. The second seal, in verse 3, it says, When he opened the second seal, 
I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. I don't think we need to explain that one. That one's self-explanatory, right? That this person is going to come in, and when he comes in, everything is going to go into chaos. It's going to be, um, oh, the purge. You guys remember the movie The Purge? I never watched it. I've only played the game that we do with balloons. Uh, but from my understanding, The Purge is that there is, there is a period of time that the government guilt gives each one because of everything, the shortage of things in life. I don't know. You guys will have to explain it to me, probably. But the amount of population and the, the low level of things that they, they give them a period to kill whoever. And if you survive that, then you just survive until the next purge. Yeah, all, all crime is legal. I'm not saying, it's gonna, that's, I'm not saying the Bible is saying, hey, there's going to be a purge, but that's the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that, that there's going to be a time when, when, when things are going to be so open that you can go and you can kill whoever you want to, and it'll be okay. Then the third seal, it says, when he opened the third seal, I heard a living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. So what it's talking about here is a famine. How many of you like paying five dollars a gallon at the pump right now? This has nothing, what we are doing and what we are seeing now pales in comparison to what it's describing right here in these verses. And we don't quite understand how bad it's going to be, but it's telling you that, that basically what you're going to do is that you're going to work a day in order to get a little bit of wheat. That, that my, my daily paycheck, that if you make $1,000 a day, you're doing really good. But if you make $1,000 a day, that $1,000 a day is going to get you one meal. We talk about inflation. We'll be wishing for $5 a gallon. Man, I remember back in the day when we, we paid $5. Because some of y'all now, you're old enough, you're like, I remember when gas was like a quarter. I don't remember that. I don't even know if I was breathing at that time. It's funny when I talk to my wife because she's only like a year and a half older than me, two years when, I, when her birthday comes, and she's like, I remember when gas was 80 cents. And I'm like, I don't remember that because I wasn't driving. I didn't care how much gas cost. <laughs> <laughs> so we will, we will look back on that day. I'll get in trouble for that later. It's okay. But we will look when we used to pay $5 a gallon for gas. I remember when we used to pay $4 a gallon for milk. I remember Josie, Sheena's son, when he went to Hawaii for the military, a gallon of milk was like 10 bucks. How many want to go to Hawaii? <laughs> yeah. I want to go, just don't buy nothing. You'll go broke. But that's what it's saying, that things will be so expensive that your daily wage that you, that you will work, but you will never make your ends meet. No matter what you do, you're just skating by. And that's only the third seal. Fourth seal, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with, and, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So I did a little math. And it says that power was given them over a fourth of the earth. So that means a fourth of the world's population at that time will die. We've been freaking out over COVID. And how many people died from COVID? Nothing compared to what, what God's word is telling us will come in a tribulation time. He says that a fourth of the world's population, so right now, the world's population is about 7.6 billion people. What's a quarter of 7.6 billion? A 
about 2 billion. It's like 1.97 billion people. About 2 billion people like that will be taken out. And it doesn't say just one way. It says that some will be killed by the sword. So that means that there's going to be fighting. There's going to be wars. There's going to be turmoil between person to person. So there are going to be people that will be murdered. But there will also be people that will die because of starvation, because of what happens before. So things would get so bad that people can't afford to eat. So some will die by, that, by, by hunger. Some will just die because they're old. That's in there with death. But then it also says by beasts of the earth. Now there's a lot of interpretation that can go with that. Um, John Lindell, when he talked about it, he said that one way that he could see was mice. He said at one point in history, which we all know this, at one point in history in England, uh, mice carried this plague around and it killed what? About a fourth of England's population. So can you imagine that with that much death, how rampant the mice will be and how rampant buzzards and different things will be that are scavengers and all this stuff. And so you have all of these things that are increasing. You have mice that are running around. This is just his thought. But you have mice that are running around that they are carrying diseases as well. So that will also ramp up the amount of people that are dying. It's not good, y'all. And, and, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a break from this. We, we will not get through all of this today. Can I, this has been one of the hardest series for me to preach, for me to prepare. I've had, I've had more distraction come. I've had more just, I don't even want to study come. I've had more things hit me trying to get ready for this sermon than any other, for this series more than any other series. And I was praying about it this morning. I have no idea. I don't know if this is, if this is exactly why, and I'm still, still asking God, God, why am I struggling so much with this? But as, as I'm reading this, one, one thing that I've, all, that I've often prayed, and I've told you guys I've prayed this a lot, that, that, I, that I pray, God, give me your heart. Break my heart for what breaks yours. That's one thing that I pray, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. I don't want to walk past something or someone that breaks God's heart, but I'm completely okay with it. Because if I'm going to have the heart and the mind of Christ, and I'm, I've got to feel how he does, I've got to think how he does, right? So I pray, God, break my heart for, for what breaks yours. And when, when I'm thinking about this, when I'm thinking about the tribulation period, when I'm thinking about everything that the Bible says is coming, I can't do it with a smile on my face. It's hard to think about. I, I told you guys the last time I preached, I said the sad truth is that there are people that are under the sound of my voice right now that you are making the decision to turn your back on Jesus Christ because you think everything is going to be okay. Well, I'm telling you, the Bible says it's not going to be okay. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be a party like you think it is. You think you're doing good and that everything will work out in the end. No. Well, I've got time. How do you know? How do you know? We don't determine it. If Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back, I don't know when he's coming back. He just tells me I'm supposed to be ready to go. So if I'm living my life according to this world system and he shows up, then guess what? I'm stuck. And I can't look at you and say that with joy on my heart. Just think about it this way, because this is a conversation that we've had. What if it was your child? That when, when it says that the trumpet will blow, that there will be a shout of an archangel, that when everything happens and we're taken up, that you look and your kid's not there. Or they look and they know that you're gone, but they're still here. So I don't, I don't want to preach on this, but I have to preach on this because you have to know that there is a day coming, that there is a time coming that's going to be so bad. I'm, I'm just going to skip. I'm going to skip a little bit. We'll come back to read the seals, but I'm going to skip a little bit because for us. As Christians, 
as believers, as those that are really living our lives for Christ. That are living according to his standard, his kingdom rule and plan. For those of us, we're not going to be here. See, because there's this, go ahead and put that first graph back up there. There, There's this little thing right here where the church is. You see that there's a line and then there's your tribulation. Well, what's this line for? There's this thing that's going to happen that's called the rapture. It's not the second coming of Christ. He doesn't come all the way to the earth, but he comes just far enough to call us home. So the tribulation period, and I truly believe this, the reason why the tribulation period is going to be so bad is because all the light is going to be gone. If we removed all light from this room, how dark would it get? It'd get real dark real quick. That's the world. So when Jesus comes and he calls us out of here and it says that we will go and we will, we will meet him in the air. That our rapture practice will no longer be practice, it will be actuality. That when we go to meet him in the earth, in the air, that we will be gone and, every, and everyone that did not want him. It's not that he didn't want to save them, it's that they chose to live without him. See, a lot of people, they say, well, why, why, does, why would God ever want to punish people? He doesn't want to punish you. He tells you in Scripture over and over and over again, I don't want to punish you. I poured out my wrath on my son so that if you accept him, you no longer have to face my wrath. But you are now forgiven that when I see you, I see the blood. That when I see you, I see my son. So you can live with me forever. You don't have to go through this stuff. Oh, God, I don't know if I want that. I don't think I want that because it's too fun here. It's not his choice, it's yours. We will be here all day if I go into what's thinking what's in my head. The fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So the fifth seal, there's martyrs, people that either have given their life during this tribulation period for, excuse me, for the confession of Jesus Christ, even in this, because I, I believe that in, in this, that the scripture tells us that there will be people that will be saved during this tribulation period. And I think that that's going to be some of the ones that may get left behind, that, that, that when people leave, that's going to be the final straw, and they're going to be like, okay, well, everything they said is true. And they're going to grab, they're going to grab hold of the confession of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so tightly that they will give their life for it. And so he says that he looks and he sees those that have given their lives for the confession, and, and, and the angel looks back, and God talks to him, and it says, hey, it's not time yet, because there's still more people that are going to give their life. And then the sixth seal happened. And I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of, of, as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and as a fig tree drops his, its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, remember what tribulation stands for. Listen to what they're going to say. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, who is able to stand it? So the mighty men, the great men of the earth, they're hiding and they're asking, kill us now because this, is, this wrath of God is too much for us to bear. But he says that there's going to be a great earthquake. Now, if you go back and 
Actually, if you guys listen to Discovery Channel, National Geographic, they say one of the greatest catastrophic events that America could face would be for, uh, where, is, where is it that they've got the geysers and stuff? Yellowstone, that that's actually a volcano, and that if that blew, there will be a tremendous, this is scientifically speaking, that there will be a tremendous amount of life that was lost, that the clouds would go up and it would block out the sun and it would actually cause like a mini ice age. Scientifically speaking. So when God's word says that, hey, there's going to be a great earthquake, mountains are going to be moved out of its place, the stars are going to fall. It may not be necessarily stars, but it could be uh, rocks of mag- burning magma that are falling. There's, there's one, one of the speakers that I listened to, I think it was John Lindell, that he said that if it's very possible that if that happened, that there could be animals and things like that, and so then you would have their blood and parts and things mixed with water that could be raining down, so that could be raining drops of blood. That science is looking at the world around us, and there's multiple, multiple volcanoes that are on the brink of rupturing. There's one that was said that it, it has a piece, a loose piece of rock that if something catastrophic were to happen, that piece of earth would slide and it would cause a tsunami that was so big that it would take out the eastern seaboard of the United States. So is it very possible what God's word is saying? And that's only six seals. I'll read the seventh seal and then we'll stop. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a, a golden censer, came and stood at the altar and was given much incense that he should offer it, offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the, from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and another earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So what is, what is, off, what is commonly said about that particular one, that when he throws it to the earth, that it, was, that it would cause a worldwide storm. I remember some years ago, that they were talking about our particular area and how we always have tornadoes and stuff like that, that I, I saw some mock-ups that they were doing. I think it was National Geographic or something like that. And they were talking about if these things were to happen, then this is possible. And they talked about just in the United States alone that actually it wouldn't be in the United States alone. But they're, they're in the path that we take, there's a wind that goes all the way around and that you could see they actually created a storm on a computer system and you could see how it would come down and it would sweep right across like Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, like it was really, really wide, and it would sweep and it would just keep going, never ending. All that to say that it's very possible. What God is saying, science is saying, hey, these things are possible by what we're seeing, by what we're studying. That even if you don't believe in God at this point and you hear something like this and you're like, wait a minute, when was the Bible written? That this particular, these particular words that I'm reading were, read, were written like A.D. 90 something. So this is Apostle John that's getting revelation from God. That he's seeing these things happen around him way, bef- way, way, way before you and I were ever thought of way before science was what it was, way before there was ever a radar or a computer system that can tell you these are the things that could happen if these things came together. Before they, were, before they ever knew that there was a loose piece of earth, that if an earthquake happened, that it would cause a tsunami that would sweep across. Before they knew any of that stuff, John was already writing saying, guys, this is what God's saying is going to happen in this tribulation period. So I'll say it again, it's not good. It's not good. Brandy, really, really quick, I know I said I stopped. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
verse 16 through 18. If you guys want to continue reading about the trumpets and other things, or I can continue next, I know Father's Day is next week, but we don't, I don't have to do a Father's Day message. I'm okay with that. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, it says this, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then, we will be with the Lord forever. And then he says this, so encourage each other with these words. If we go one more to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, it says, But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protect, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God has chose to save us. God has chosen. God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on who? On us. For God chose, or sorry, for, for Christ died, keep going, for Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. And then it says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So for us as Christians, everything that I've read, and let me tell you, there's even more. That was only, that was only the seals. That wasn't the trumpets and that wasn't the bowls. That the tribulation period is, is the darkest, the hardest time ever. And should it scare you? If you're not saved, yes. If you don't know Jesus Christ, absolutely. When I was listening to John Lindell, he said, you know, some of you are like, Pastor, you're trying to scare us. He said, yes, and I'm not afraid to say it. I'm not. Because it's that serious, y'all. It's that important. That without, without Jesus, you are choosing to go through everything that sin brings into this world. You're choosing everything that's coming because you think you can handle it on your own. And I'm telling you, you can't. You think things are bad now. This is nothing. This is nothing. Well, I can't go to school because I'm afraid because they just had another school shooting. This is nothing compared to how bad it's going to get. Do I, hate, do I hate that we're having school shootings? Yes, but God's word tells me it's going to be worse Because then all hope, all light, all truth is going to be gone. If you know him, how many of you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That if you know him, you're not going to be here. So we can encourage one another, hey guys, man, it's getting dark outside, but guess what? We won't be here when it gets really, really bad. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. But also... Remember what, what, was it Peter that, that wrote this? What, what, what type of person, what manner of person are you to be knowing that these things are coming? I remember, and I, I say this a lot, go ahead and come up. I've, I've used this story a lot because it, I, I just can't forget it. I can't, I can't forget the image that I saw, I can't, forget the words that he said, but it was a magician, um, I think it's Teller, from Penn and Teller, or no, Penn, or forget, whichever one talks, that's who it was, because there's one that talks and there's one that doesn't, you guys know, there's one that talks and there's one that doesn't, whichever one does the talking, that's the one it was, and, and he, he made a, a short uh, YouTube or Facebook video some years ago where after a show, this guy came up and he began to what he called proselytize. It was to tell him about Jesus Christ. And he said that he brought, he brought me this Bible and he handed it to me. And he said, now you guys know me that I'm an atheist. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe in religious things like that. And he said, but I don't have a problem with somebody coming to share what they believe is true with me. And he goes on and he actually says that he actually has a problem with those that believe that but don't share. And as he's talking, he begins to cry. 
And he says, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe that all those things are true but not tell them? How much do you have to hate someone to know that there's a bus coming and not tell them that it's coming? And that's from an atheist that's still to this day a professed atheist. It didn't change his heart, but he challenged a believer. He challenged me to say, if you believe that all those things are true, if you believe that that day is going to be so bad, why don't you tell me the truth? Why do you sugarcoat it? Why do you say that everything is going to be okay? Why do you say I can live in sin? Why do you say that I can do this even though I know it's not according to God's word, that I can leave it, live this way and you tell me that it's okay? <laughs> that you hide behind Jesus loves you. It is a true statement. Yes, Jesus loves you. But it's qualified by the fact that Jesus loves you so much that he knew these days were coming. He told us that these days were coming and he gave his life to save you from those days. That he gave his life to rescue you. This is what the story of the cross is. It's a rescue mission. Because you and I, we need a Savior. Not only for the days that are coming before the hell that awaits us after those days, it gets still even worse. That the tribulation period is bad, but he also tells us that there is a hell. That there is a fire that burns eternally, that there is no quenching, there is no rescue, there is no saving from it. That if you go to that place, a place that was never created for his people, that was created for the devil and his angels is what the Bible says. That he says that if you go to that place that you're going to be in eternal torment. That the tribulation period will look like a picnic compared to that. That you will face fire that burns eternally, that you will face the pain of it, that you will that you will have worms that will eat you, that you will never be, but they will never devour you, devour you. like this is what it says in scripture. It's not good apart from Christ. So Jesus gives us through John a picture of this period of tribulation. But before the period of tribulation, there's that moment, there's that second of rapture that's possible for everyone that puts their faith and their life in the hands of God. Not just, the, not, not just by saying a prayer, but by giving your life to Him and living your life despite what anybody else says for him and him alone. So my question for you in the room, online, wherever you may be, is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Is he your rescue? If he's not, right now is your opportunity. Right now, right here is your moment to change that. Well, I'll do it when I get home because I'm a little bit embarrassed. What if you don't make it home? What if, what if he came as soon as I said amen? You don't know when you'll get the opportunity, but you have that opportunity right here, right now.